So we are here live at Poinciana and we made it. We have, what do we have? We I think we've got 14 horses all together. Everybody, everyone made the trip great. Actually, I think now we have 15. So we just have one spot for one more. Um, horses made it great. The girls and all my staff up north, everyone did a great job packing, unpacking, driving, all the things. Huge shout out to Steve Lohack and Tim Post for helping us get all the way down here really safe. Um, it did take 12 hours. There was an accident on 95, so we had to get off the highway and take some back roads. And I took Isaac and Freddie in my big trailer, and then the guys took all the other horses in box stalls. Everyone traveled great. We've been riding. Everybody's been good. Freddie survived the outdoors, so that was like big win today. I feel really excited about that personally. Um, we saw Allie today. She came out for a lesson with Apollo. We have vet appointments this weekend. So yeah, we are circling our wagons and getting everything under control. We have not made a show schedule yet, but I'm sure we will share with you as soon as we get that. And yeah, I've got a special guest with me tonight, Teresa Schaefer. I thought it would be really fun to go over again goal setting. I got a lot of wonderful feedback from the last live about, you know, just talking about goals. And I thought, you know, even after that live, I thought what would be a really great thing would be to take a couple of horses and sort of share our goals with those horses. And so you guys can kind of like follow along with what we're doing, how it's going, how we adjust, because, you know, I think there's a funny saying that um, if you want to hear God laugh, you make plans. And so, you know, keeping with that, you know, it's a little bit like I feel this ability to be resilient and the ability to adjust and know nothing is permanent. I think those are really important things um, to keep in mind when we talk about goals and especially with horses. You know, I mean, I think some deeper personal goals of like, I would like to be more patient or I'd like to be, you know, more enthusiastic in my life or show up in a bigger way for my family or in myself or like those you can always work on. But also with horses, it's, um, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes because, you know, not, not only do we have to communicate with an animal who does not speak English, but, you know, then we're like imposing our own goals on what we think should happen. And sometimes not everything lines up together. So I thought it would be fun. Teresa and I talk about this stuff all the time. And uh, she's really one of my favorite people. So, and I'm not just saying that because she's sitting here with me across the, <laughs> the, in the room, but she really is. And we talk about some really good stuff. So I thought it would be great for you guys to be in on our conversation as well. So yeah, with no further ado, I'm going to switch my camera around. And there she is. Hey, little T. Okay. So I wanted to, you know, just kind of go through for you guys out there to also be part of one of our goal setting meetings about like, how do you decide what to think about and how do you, you know, name your goals and how much energy do you put into your goals and like, what happens if it doesn't work out? So, I mean, I know y'all listen to me pretty great, but I thought it would be really fun to listen to, you know, one of my wonderful amateur riders who's been with me, um, Come on, nine, years. nine years. So that's really fun. And, you know, I just thought it'd be a great conversation to start. So if you guys have any questions, I will be able to read them much better when I'm talking. It's not so easy for me to like read all the comments, but um, yeah, I wanted to just first start out with a little tea about, you know, what are your goals? And if you wanted to, you know, just look at everything with Team Tate, it's like, it's not just about riding. It's not just about horses. It's really about personal growth and who you are with the horses and who 
the horses bring out. Whether that's good or bad, I mean, we talk about that all the time. Of, you know, sometimes we all need our own little half halt. Um, and so I, I really want to kind of get into, you know, what are your goals? And you can sort of separate them by like goals for you and Isaac, goals for Isaac, goals for you maybe as a team, and then goals for you personally. Okay. So I guess I'll, I'll start with his and I's collective goals. And, um, you know, we've talked in the past about um, when, I, when you and I started together and then with Isaac, I really wanted to learn to ride each level well. And so, so for us collectively, where we are in our phase of learning right now would be to get a lot better at fourth level with our eyes set on the pre-St. George. So if I had my dream, that would be like what I, he and I would accomplish together this year. Um, after I showed fourth level in August, it became apparent. Got to speak up. It, okay, it became apparent. <laughs> after we showed fourth level in August, it became apparent that um, he needed quite a bit more strength in order for him to be able to do that work. So I think for Isaac himself, he needs a lot more strength in order to be able to do a better job at fourth level and, um, and then with our eyes set to pre St. George. For me personally, I think A, I need to get a lot more confidence, a lot more confidence in myself that I can do it. And then secondly, the quality of my writing and the attention to detail of how I need to be riding at fourth level with my eyes that the free St. George needs to go up considerably. So those are my goals. And so like when you talk about you personally needing to like really grow, like what does that mean? As like not just like attention to detail, but like where, like when you get on every day, like what are you thinking about like, how do you make that tangible? You know what I mean? Like when you get in the saddle and you're like, okay, today I am taking one step closer to pre-St. George. Like what do you, what, like, what's your self talk about that? Well, I guess I try to remember everything that you have been telling me <laughs> all along. That's right. I, I want to make sure when I get on that the reaction, his reaction to me is, is there just from the basic of when I put my leg on, what do you do? Just from the very basics, I try to have a checklist of things that I go through to make sure the response is there. Mm -hmm. But then in my own mind, I, as far as my level of writing, I'm trying to implement and make sure I hold myself to the highest, like, like uh, accountability of look, you know, eyes looking straight ahead, sitting back shoulders being back, mm -hmm. like just the things that I know that I need to be doing, I even just apart from the horse as far as my quality of yep. riding, that I hold myself to that standard. I love that because a lot of times when we sell horses, people call and they'll be like, do you think this horse has Grand Prix potential? And I, I really answer back with, I don't know, like, do you? Because really like, what we bring out of the horse is what we ride into it. I always talk to my riders about making the horse honest and making them strong and making them happy about their bodies and how they feel. But it's also about what are you riding into them? And are you striving to be like your, your Grand Prix? Like who is the version of you as a Grand Prix person? And you know, like a lot of times we, you know, define things in classes or horse shows like, oh, I need to do this class or whatever. So tell me a little bit about your process kind of this whole year. I think <laughs> starting in Florida, like last year, um, I thought you had a really full year of growth from the serpentine line at Yellowbird with him. That was hard, you know, and you rallied and you got through it. And then, you know, so I, I would love you to like talk a little bit through the process of, yes, you showed fourth level. Yes, you got scores for your silver medal. Yes, we're on our way to pre-St. George. But just like talk us through your last year and maybe the goals you had for last winter 
and then like the goals you and how that went and then your goals for the summer and how that went mm -hmm. and then how you needed to adjust. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I guess I would first of all say that for, like all of this for me with Isaac has kind of been like icing on the cake because it so far has exceeded anything that I ever thought would happen. My goal really for him was to learn the flying changes, which <laughs> one, of the, one of the last talks that we had done, I mean, that was no small, no, it was no small feat. So I felt like it was a huge accomplishment last year that we were able to show third level and get, and do pretty well and get changes on the spot when we were supposed to. So I was super thrilled with that. So with that for last year, just getting to show that third level with confirmed changes after the journey that we were on the year prior, <laughs> I thought it was a whole lot to be a whole lot to be proud of. So with that, I thought again, okay, I, you know, I was kind of it was it was a dream that was way out there for me, but for showing fourth level, I thought, you know, I would that, that's the next logical step. We had done fairly well at third level. I thought, let's step it up and let's let's try it. That for me, like on one hand, I was so incredibly grateful to actually be doing it, because again, Showing my rescue pony at third level and then much less fourth level was, was really just a huge accomplishment for me. So far, it exceeded anything that I thought. But I think what came out of that show for me was a few things. I think, um, that, like I said before, that he was not quite strong enough to actually really be able to do the collected work. Mm -hmm. And then I also think for me, it really identified weaknesses in my own writing and um, how much really needed to be more developed within me. And I think it was a, a bit of a, a humbling uh, place for me to really have to step back and reassess that I, it did not look, nor did it score like what I really wanted it Or to. feel. I or mean, you feel. came out of that ring was, a little disappointed that, you yeah. know, the wheels kind of fell off the bus and it didn't feel as organized as you'd hoped and, and you know. And it was painful for me to watch the video. I mean, like, I had to kind of watch it with one eye. Because <laughs> it, was, it was hard for me to see. Yes. But, but again, it was a reflection of where we were in the particular process. We had yeah, in that there, moment of time. Which was in August. And so, again, I would try to engage all of that, that, that I was thrilled to be where we were at third level in June. We made a step and a reach for something in August. Um, I wasn't super thrilled with the result, but it was also another point of recalibration to be like, okay, what do I need now? And what do I need to change in order to go forward? So with that, of course, JJ being JJ immediately goes into thinking about what the horse needs and how we need to develop the horse. I unfortunately went through a very bad spell of telling <laughs> myself how terrible I am. Like I was so disappointed with myself. I really I actually thought that I was better than the what I had demonstrated in that particular show. I wanted to be better than what I demonstrated in that show. So I have to say, while JJ is like actively like working with Isaac, figuring out what he needs, I went from like September to November really down on myself and really discouraged and probably lost a lot of confidence. And then unfortunately, I hate to admit this, but um, I sort of turned all of my frustration with myself more towards Isaac. And so we spent about three months and it was, I would, I would hate, hate to say it, but it was fairly combative. So instead of um, looking at, at ways to develop my own riding to make it better, while JJ simultaneously working on the horse and helping him develop, I went through a three month stretch of it. Um, my efforts were really counterproductive to my goal of reaching fourth level and it was fairly difficult for the horse. Well, and I think what's really interesting that it wasn't, so I'm going to switch the camera around a little bit.
<laughs> on that, and we'll do fourth level two, uh, which is still accomplishment in some ways because this little rescue pony, you know, got scores into the 60s for fourth level. I did, I did talk her out of fourth level test three <laughs> <laughs> because that I'm like, whoa, that's a doozy. Like, um, I think that counter canter is going to do a sim. So let's just time it out on that. And we'll do fourth level two, uh, which is still it, really hard. Um, and I do think for them, prepares them well for how quick everything comes in the pre-St. George. But I do think it's interesting because sometimes we, we use like test riding as like these standardized ways of like, okay, there's a lot of things. And we'll go into this because we're down in Wellington and we'll be going to shows and we'll, we'll bring you along to all these shows. Because there are a lot of elements that create success at a horse show. And sometimes, whether you get a good score or not, sometimes even depends on who's sitting in the booth. So that you don't have any control over, like at all. So um, it's, it's important not to attach our self-worth to the outcome, but a little bit more to the process. And so it's interesting that as... You know, she she did the fourth level. We celebrated. It was it was part of the process, right? Scores weren't amazing, but it was respectful. Got the scores for the silver medal. Great. Like now, now, now what? And it was interesting because I did go into this like, well, he needs a lot more collection. I really feel like the pirouettes aren't there yet. I really want to work on the collection and the canter. And meanwhile, like little T is just like. <laughs> just annoyed and like irritated about like the whole thing. And so it's interesting that then sometimes showing can poke the wrong bear. I mean, I love to show and little T loves to show. We're kind of competitive. That's fun. But it's this really internal challenge. But I challenge everyone out there to not put all your eggs in that basket to get yourself worth from that score like and good scores too like just because you got a good score doesn't mean oh my god I'm doing everything great like you need to kind of know where you are in relationship to your ideal self and sort of judge yourself against that and not like what that one performance was what that score happened to be from that judge you know and to be able to look at it uh, in a really neutral and unemotional way. So let's go back into that a little bit and turn the camera around. And he's very, very sensitive about energy because he was feral and starved to death. Like he has strong opinions. The reason why he survived is because of that strength in him, which we love, but is sometimes, um, you know, not, not, not easy to, to handle the message he's giving us. So tell us about where you were emotionally about that. And I mean, I know you said like you, you were feeling like not great about yourself, but then the shift that happened because ladies and gentlemen, little T had her best ride ever today. So there was a major shift that happened in the fall. So I want her to talk about that. And I guess I would just like to offer one thing that my main reason in showing, well, I guess was twofold, which was, you know, JJ said to me long ago that it was a part of the education process, the total education process. So I really took that to heart that I did want to show because uh, it was part of the learning process, um, but uh, and I am competitive. But with that being said, um, I think it, uh, I was so disappointed with myself. Not even necessarily with the score, but with the show. I just was. But like what? Like what was disappointing? I think in the way that I wrote him, as far as asking for 
you know, because the level of engagement and the accuracy of the test. And there's just some things that I could have, know that I could have. You felt like you wrote it sloppy. Sloppy. Okay. And it was not accurate. I went off course even, like things that were. Controllable. Oh, yeah. That, things, that, control that, the controllables, people. We talked so, about that last time. So I think that I was really, you know, like just, just discipline. I could have done a better job. I, with the things that I knew yes. to do, I could have yes. done a better job. Okay, so I like that. So let me say that it's really not so much tied to the result of the show as much as I was disappointed with my how family. you were able to present yes. it yes yes, yes. so <clears throat> instead of really like refocusing on holding myself to that higher standard that I said in the beginning of the things that I know to do in my own writing that's where I began to get frustrated with the things that are difficult for Isaac it's very difficult with the way Isaac is made to ask him to really come around. His neck is really, really tricky. Yeah. I mean, he's built downhill, so his hind legs are out behind him. I mean, that's just, that's how God made him. So anyway, that's, that's how he is. But instead of, like, knowing that about him and then really holding myself to a higher standard of riding and caliber, I just was frustrated and angry with, with both of us. But then, after Charles, Charles came... In November. Oh, so Charles. It really was like literally three months, and my, my husband would call me every day. I'd be driving home after my ride, and he was like, How was, how was the ride? I'm like, It was terrible. It was terrible. <laughs> my mom would call, and she's like, How was the ride? Terrible. And I really felt like I was fighting with my, my relationship with Isaac because he and I have, have such a good partnership. It literally just felt like we were not getting along, and like I was fighting with Andy, my husband. It was a horrible feeling. Anyway, Charles comes in November. And, and he is yeah, always right. Forward. And he just, again, was talking about like how we are the custodians of the horse. They, they don't ask to do this. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the responsibility of the rider to ride with excellence and to ride, you know, to ride the horse absolutely to this high standard. And I will be honest, I was so convicted of my attitude towards my horse I had somewhere along the line lost any bit of gratefulness that here I am on my rescue horse that I had just shown fourth level, which far exceeded any like dream that I had ever had thought. And so again, so it, like I had to really like, um, I'll be honest. I mean, I feel like this was this is the animal that God has given me. He's entrusted to my care, and my heart and attitude towards him and towards the whole process was all wrong and so it was just amazing to listen to Charles to kind of be like reminded of what that a that it's a gift that I even get to do this at all this horse is a gift to me to be a part of this journey is a gift and the fact that he even lets me do any of this uh, is amazing and so anyway it just was like it was like okay it was in a shift it was literally like a control out delete that happened within me and all of a sudden, I just began, like, thanking him. Like, every time I would get on the horse, I just would tell him how wonderful I think he is and thank you so much for letting me ride you. And then, you know, also, the, like, with JJ and our lessons, it's, like, really now coming in with a laser-like focus of really implementing what she's telling me to do. And, and it's amazing how, as I've focused on the quality of my riding, like, being better, like, with my aids, my seat, being mindful of my hands, putting that all together, he's, we now have our synergy and our partnership back, and, and me, it's the, the harmony is back, but I just think there was a shift in my, A, my thinking, and a shift in my heart, and then also being reminded of what a gift it is to do it, yep. period. Back to me. <laughs> <laughs> because of course I have something to say about that. <laughs> um, first off, Charles is always right. I mean, we all know that we're all here because we love Charles, but it is always this interesting thing that I know I struggle with because, you know, it's this art and it's this beautiful partnership and I love my horses so much. Like we're still here and We've been here since this morning <laughs> and it's just horse, horse, horse all the time. But I do think when you start to, you know, get that whole competition in your mind and accomplishing things, which is good. Like that is a part of the goal setting process because that's tangible, right? Like I want to be a better rider. Like 
That's not like narrow it down. Like, what does that mean? That's why the USDF medals mean something because it's like you have shown a level of competency at this level. Like, yay, great job. Here's your medal. But I do think when Charles, and Charles has always done this for me, so does his book, um, Ethics and Passions. Amazing. Y'all should get it if you don't have it. And like, that's really one of the main reasons I have kept Charles so close in my heart and in my life, because there's always this half halt of what is this really about? And it isn't, you know, what the horse can do for us. It's about what we can do for him. And that like shift is huge. And then it's about being able to back away from the outcome that wasn't exactly what you wanted. Like we all want to get a 70%, right? Like that's, you know, what we're, well, ooh, that's, that's fun. That like proves I'm doing great. Well, so then does like a 52% just prove I suck. And then like every bad negative word I've ever said about myself, see, that's true. And it's like, Sometimes just getting to the horse show and getting a stupid 52, like who cares? I'm part of the 49er club. Like it's all part of the growth. And maybe that horse was lame, half dead, hated, hated life, couldn't canter, whatever. And just getting to the horse show was a win. You take that 52 and you freaking frame it on your wall because that proved you got there. You're putting the effort in. You're doing the thing. Because a lot of people can stand back and say, well, you know, that's a 52 or a 58 or who cares, whatever, you know. And, and it's like everyone is going through their own journey and their own troubles and their own challenges. And it's so important to just like surround the whole thing with love and understanding and gratitude is a huge thing. But it's so interesting about Charles, always brings me back to that. So I was really thrilled that little T had that uh, experience too, that like you go to the show and you just get like wrapped up in it. And we were talking earlier and we were like, you get wrapped up and then you get like this like, ugh, this narrow focus of I need to do this thing and he's not doing it. The horse is not doing it. It's his fault. He's not good enough. He's not made for this. He's not cooperating. Blah, 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 right? He's so stiff. And instead, we've got to be like, how can I help this horse who doesn't ever ask to be here? He does not want, like you know what I'd like to do? Practice my passage today in the sun for the next 25 minutes till you're happy with the way it feels. Like they did not sign up for that. They want to be in the field eating grass with their friends. So like bless them. Oh, you know, they're, I always say they're like literally like angels on this planet. I mean, what, what, what they allow us to do is like amazing. So starting from that grateful place, really frees up our like, you know, crazy perfectionist, disappointed expectation and be like, how can I best serve my partner today? Because maybe he's stiff. Maybe he didn't, you know, get out in the paddock today or, you know, like this, this really like empathetic, compassionate, this is my dance partner and I want him to feel comfortable with me and that I see him for who he is, but I would like to maybe like, hmm, like make him a little stronger or give him this skill to do. But it like, it's so easy to get so disappointed about ourselves or the horse and, and that's just like, not not a healthy emotion to bring into training horses. So it's really great. Like that, it's like a difficult process to move through, you know, and I, I really wanted uh, Teresa to talk about that because I fight that, I fought that. I would be riding around global 
with Fiji, who, God bless him, he's doing great. He's at Elizabeth's, doing great. She's having a great time. He's a little frisky in the, uh, in the cold weather, so he's, 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 she's having a great time. I miss him. This is like my first winter down uh, probably in 10 years without Feej, so that's an adjustment for me. But, I mean, I would ride around a global and totally be thinking, like, we are not good enough to be here. My horse doesn't trot like that. Oh my God, he's not fancy enough. He doesn't have the big neck. Like, what do I look like? Am I good enough to be here? And then, you know, you get these, as Brene Brown talks about it, she talks about the gremlins, you know, and then the gremlins come out and they're like, yeah, well, yeah, you're not good enough. And he's not fancy enough. And then you know what? You tell those gremlins to go away and you go out and win the four star and get that gremlin off your shoulder because negative self-talk like does not help anybody. So we can't give energy to that, but it's, you got to find it. You got to know yourself and you got to like, there's a gremlin. I hear it. He's telling me bad things and you just got to be aware of it and then surround it with love and, and let it go and be like, you know what? That's not my truth, you know? And it was amazing because I remember being in Chicago when Fiji was six and I was overwhelmed by all these fancy horses, right? Because the Young Horse Championships is like the fanciest young horses in our country. I'm riding around on Fiji and he's like not very fancy. And Scott like sees me. Scott Hassler uh, was coaching me and he's seeing me like, oh my God, look at that one. And he's like, listen, you ride your ride. You have trained Fiji. He is classy. He is correct. You own that. And you go in there and you ride your ride. And that became my goal that weekend. That was not to win the class. Of course, that would have been fun, you know, because who doesn't like winning, <laughs> to be honest, right? Like everybody likes to sit with the winter cooler. Y'all saw my picture with my cooler from the four star. I think I probably slept in it that night because I'm like, oh my God, I, did, I won. It was amazing. But like my goal shifted at that horse show and I was like, yeah, Scott, you make me feel proud of myself and which is what coaches are supposed to do, right? And I thought, I have trained this horse and this horse is supple, he is elastic, he is a very good walk and he's very well trained and he's really obedient and we can just go out and show that. And I just let go of the rest. And then he was reserve champion behind like Pico de Cero who like went on to like almost go to the Olympics, I think. Like the horse was, you know, it was a breeding stallion and, you know, but it was like that, I could have like freaked out and been like, Fiji, you're not good enough, da, 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 da. You know, and I'd like get after him and get that like narrow mindset of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's think about why we're here. I love this horse. I am proud of this horse. I am proud of the training I did on this horse. I'm grateful to be here. The sun is out. This is awesome, you know? And like keeping that in perspective is really powerful. And then the exact thing you are seeking comes to you. It's like this crazy thing about the world. <laughs> you know, when you're like, I wanna do that, I wanna win. You know, it just like, it just like gets pushed away. But like when you come from this place of, clarity and honesty of like, why are we really here? It, it, the thing you were seeking actually comes to you. So I'm turning the camera around again. Sorry to jump. I jumped in because <laughs> I'm a talker. <laughs> so I want you to talk about, uh, what do you do when you have to change or adjust your goal? Like when things aren't working out, how, you know, we all have the big dream, right? There's all like Isaac's big dream is pre St. George. And I mean, honestly, we always say this, like anything after any, every day, honestly, is just awesome because he's already exceeded our expectations because it's, he's amazing, but we still got a dream because if we don't dream, we're not inspired. And so then that's no fun, you know? So it's like, wow, you know, what's the big dream? Big dreams, pre St. George. But like you have a lot of other horses in your life. Uh, little T like does her own barn and rides all these horses like 
she's amazing and she works really hard. And she, yes, she has her horse in training with me. And so she doesn't like ride him every day. But when she comes, she's also extremely focused and very diligent about her mental homework when she's not here. So I want to talk about that. Okay. So let's just jump into that real quick. Like, tell us about how you stay focused and like reconnect with him. Like coming, how you know, because you're not able to ride him every day, which is a really important thing for you. Right. And I appreciate you trusting me to be his and tall that, mom. It's <laughs> been a hard, I think that's probably been the hardest thing for me is not riding him every day. But I think with that, then what I had to realize is, okay, since I can't ride him five days a week like it normally was in my, my program, I need to make every time that I ride him, both for him and for me, really, really, really count. And so I am fortunate, though, I think, after being able to ride with you now for so many years, having a real understanding and foundation of your teaching and the way that it's supposed to be, but really coming in and really applying with whatever we had gone over, even maybe the lesson before, to make sure that I'm doing that to the highest level that I possibly can do. And what's your process on that? Because, I mean, someone I couldn't remember, I think it was maybe, oh, I don't know exactly who it was, who said, like, watching their own videos are hard. And that is true. Is. And my sports psychologist told me, you got to watch your video three times before you stop judging how fat you think your thighs look. <laughs> I mean, little T can't look fat, but, uh, you know, I got a, I got a little drunk in my trunk. So, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, God. What? You know, so you got to just, like, unfortunately, you got to keep watching it till it's like, you're not judging yourself and you're actually seeing it as what it really is. Because that's hard to like see it actually from, I sometimes think about it, it's like someone else. I'm watching, that's not me, that's JJ, my student. You know, and so then it's not this like, well, God, my left toe still sticks out. And what the hell was I thinking there? Ugh, and my coat looks bleh. and my white pants make my thighs look fat. You know, like just like it's crazy. And you're like, what does that horse look like? You know, like uh, whatever. You just get like all jazzed out about what it's looking like. And that's not the that's just negative, judgmental, human nature, completely normal. But we can't let it take over. So then we only watch it once because we think it looks like terrible. So then the learning tool is away. But tell us a little bit your process because you have a special thing with your phone that you do in your lessons and then tell us about your process. I use the voice memo app on my phone. And so <clears throat> usually every lesson I like set it, my phone next to JJ and record our lessons. And then usually either on my ride back home or when I'm playing stalls the next day, then I go and I just listen and I listen and I listen to the actual lessons. And then the other thing that really helps me is watching her videos, and especially being able to watch her videos on the Academy of Isaac. And again, getting in my mind what it's supposed to look like. And then just striving to, like with the skills that you're teaching me, apply those between the listening and then the watching and then the retaining of all the instruction and knowledge. So take all three of those for me. I did not tell her to say that. <laughs> that was just a really <laughs> genuine Team Tate Academy. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> so one more question is like, what is your process? Like we kind of got into that a little bit and then I interrupted with another question. But like, how do you cope with the disappointment of, let's say, another horse that, you know, isn't going to fulfill what you, with the dream you had or the goals you had? Like, how do you adjust your goals? Like, what is your process for the adjustment period? Because we all make goals that just don't work out. Yeah. And it's kind of okay because what's meant to happen, happens. And what wasn't meant to happen, happened for a reason. And maybe that's not clear right away, but 
the, the truth will soon be revealed, right? And so tell us a little bit about your personal process of how you um, adjust. Sometimes it's it's a probably a little bit messy if I were honest. Um, I had uh, a pony that I had bought that was supposed to be kind of following behind Isaac, my next one t- to develop, and he got injured over the summer, and so I you know I I dressed that and so forth. But it just became um, apparent that he may not like he came from a jumper barn that dressage might just not exactly be what he loves to do. And so when the injury happened and then just knowing him, I find myself a lot of times scrambling. So I'm like trying to figure anything I can do, I try to do to make it work, like give him all the treatment options, which I think is the right thing to do anyway, and then gather a lot of you know advice and input. Um, and so I, I find myself kind of scrambling, trying to hold on, trying to make it work. And then... Um, I think sometimes the harder I try to hold on to something, the more it becomes unraveled. <laughs> so then I kind of go through this next phase of maybe accepting or like, hmm, what could be really happening here? And in his case, like he's not getting better and he's actually getting worse. And, uh, and I've done everything I know to do and I've sought wise counsel and he's been treated. So this is just my, exa- my example that I'm living with right now. And so I think to myself, well, you know, what do I do? And I think in and through this whole process, there's also been a fair amount of grief. Mm-hmm. Like each time, like it was a bit of grief when he first got injured and then did everything and followed all the protocols and he's still not responding. And then I think it's another letting go, letting go of what I had hoped and the letting go of, um, you know, uh, you know, it, is he going to be able to be the next horse for me? Is he now, is he even going to be competition sound? And I think it's now to the point, is, you know, is he going to be able to be able to like live? So each process, I think for me is just, I, I, I do the very best I can with surrounding myself with really good people, try to take the situation in, what's happening, good, 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 good advice, good care. And then also like looking at it realistically for what is really happening, grieve, what my goals and dreams and hopes and aspirations were, and then try to continually deal day to day with what it is that I'm given. And just always trying to remind myself that at the end of the day, I'm the custodian of the horse. I've got to do what is best for him, whether or not it lines up with what my dreams were for the horse. Yes. Yes. perspective too of like it goes into with what we do with these horses like they can't speak so we have to be their spokesperson and you know it's so powerful to sometimes have it go to that level you know like when when we lost Duffy this summer um that was like a fast 12 hours and then he was just gone he was just dead and you know you you do the best with what you know at the time and of course you know it's um it's we're in charge of their lives and a lot of times we're you know sometimes complaining about the shoulder in or that he's hanging on my right rein and it's like you know uh, of all the things I've learned this year it's been a big year of adjustment for everyone uh, for me personally, I have uh, gone through a lot of loss. So like for Teresa to talk about like, do I need to put this horse down um, resonates really heavy with me because I had to do that twice this year. Um, and one with a very old horse who had a wonderful life. And that was, I knew that was coming. I kind of thought it was coming for like the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it was like at some point this, you know, it's happening. But like with Duffy, it was a terrible shock and sad that that just went that fast and then it was over. And so this this idea of like really to be grateful every day and that to really understand that nothing is permanent. The sun shining, that's great, but that's not permanent. So when it's raining, we also have to recognize that that's not permanent. 
So when things are going terrible and it's you're frustrated and your, your horse isn't getting the whatever, this too shall pass, you know? And so we also have to embrace the good times and just be so grateful that they're here and that we have the chance to even do it um, can really help us adjust when things aren't great. Because, you know, just like the weather in Florida, they say like, wait five minutes, it'll, it'll change. And, you know, that's the same thing for, you know, I was driving down to Florida and I'll probably share a picture of it because I can't remember who actually sings the song. But it's, uh, it's a country song because I like country because I like stories, if you can't imagine that. <laughs> um, and he talks about, you know, it's a crazy, tragic, you know, um, you know, awful, sometimes beautiful, magic life, you know. And uh, I'll see if I can get it, you know, posted up here. And I was driving along and I was like, it is, it's beautiful and it's tragic and it's incredible and it's hard and it's amazing and that's life. And when we ride our horses, it's a little mini cosm of life. Mm -hmm. And to be able to really keep your eye on the prize, like my dear friend T Buddha would always say, but without being narrow-minded and like, crazy if it doesn't work out exactly how you want it. You know, it's really about surfing on the wave of change and being adjustable, but not lost. You know, we need to be able to adjust our goals for what is being shown to us, right? It's also not healthy to be uh, in denial about who your horse is trying to show you who he is, right? Like if he just hates working and doesn't like to go to the arena and then just just a unhappy partner, maybe he wants to go jump, you know? And that's not that's not giving up. That's just seeing the situation for what it is creating success for everybody involved. And so I wanna thank little T for being here today. I'm gonna turn the camera around. Thank you, Teresa, for being here and sharing with us some of the trials and tribulations of Team Tate and you know how to be an excellent horse woman and the best advocate for your horse. And I, and I love it that you're so open to your growth because growth is hard and uncomfortable and frustrating. And I know when I'm in the middle of a growth spurt, I'm ornery and I'm irritated and I'm sharp because it's uncomfortable. <laughs> and yes, and God bless our horses for putting up with us when we get like that, which is even all the more reason to appreciate them so much. Because again, we always have to think about what, how we can serve them and not what they need to do for us. So thank you so much. She's already done with her wine, so she can't toast. <laughs> so I just wanted to also say two things. Number one, tell all your friends about how fun Team Tate TV is because I'm going to give a free year subscription to the Team Tate Academy as a working student for the 45th hundredth member. So we're almost there. So tell your friends, all that stuff. But I really want to give a huge toast to Jane Savoy, who I did share a little post about her. And, you know, we've had a lot of loss uh, this year. And cancer sucks. And we'll just, just throw that out just in general. That cancer's, cancer is hard. And I want to send Rhett all of our love and, you know, support all of her you know, really buoy up her friends and family with love because she was such an amazing woman, so incredibly positive, and she spoke a lot about how to stay positive in difficult times with 
changing your goals and she was an incredible woman and I hope all of you go and get her book. I left it at the house, but I was gonna bring it. Um, that Winning Feeling, amazing book, changed my whole outlook on writing. She was a huge influence uh, on my mindset. You know, she always used to say that, you know, everybody gets nervous and everybody gets butterflies and it's important to just get those butterflies flying in formation. And I always love that because it's not about denying the butterflies, right? Like we all get nervous. Everybody gets nervous. And it's about being able to put them all in formation so the butterflies fly uh, with, with you and not just like fluttering all around. I'll never forget that. And um, she had another book. It's not just about the ribbons. I highly recommend all of those books. She's amazing. God bless her. She was an incredible force of positivity and just a wonderful, wonderful woman and we will miss her greatly. And we wanna uh, thank her for all of the contributions she made to all of us and our sport. So here's to Jane, God bless her. God bless all of you guys out there too. I hope you guys enjoyed our talk tonight. Make it a great night.